So we gather again this evening for our study in the Word. We've been looking at the epistles of John to the believers, to the, the churches in Asia. We've been looking at First John. We've gone through First John chapter 1. We've gone through chapter 2. And we are now in chapter 3. And so this evening we are going to pick up from verse 9. And I think we'll be go, we will go right up to maybe about verse 12 if we can. Um, but we'll see how, how far we can go um, this evening. So first John chapter 3 from verse 9. And we read to verse, verse 12. Amen. 1 John 3, verse 9 to 12. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that he heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. So here we have it from the writings of the Apostle John. Verse 9 and following. But verse 9. And in order for us to look into verse 9, we need to remember 1 John 1, verse 8, and also chapter 1, verse, verse 10. You have your Bibles there, could read those two verses for me. That's ver chapter 1, verse 8, and chapter 1, and verse 10. Verse 8, if, he, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Great. So whilst we have this discussion, we have to be able to balance these three, three verses and, um, and reconcile them. The... So John clearly is not teaching sinlessness on the part of, of the Christian. Whosoever is born of God. This phrase is the description of every Christian. Because every Christian is born of God. If you're not born of God, it means you're not a Christian. Every believer is born of God. Now remember John has addressed his entire congregation as the children of God in chapter 3 and verse 1. And the only way we can become children of God is by being adopted as the sons of God. Right? And so we are children of God. And he says here, Whosoever is born of God. So that includes every Christian. Whosoever is born of God. Every Christian. And he's not speaking denomination here. John is speaking about salvation. Those who have been adopted as the sons of God. Whichever denomination you, at, you belong to. Yes? So whosoever is born of God 
does not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. So while many teachers and commentaries stress the continual aspect of sin, John is declaring the absence of all sin. John is not talking about a continual aspect of sin, but is declaring the absence of all sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. So since God is the source of the Christian's birth, and since he is completely perfect, yes, his offspring by nature must be perfect as well. So like begats like. Huh? So if the father is perfect, then we expect the offsprings to be perfect because you should look somewhat like your father. Huh? The Lord says, be he holy for I am holy. Amen. Praise God. Now, such an idea of a child of a sinless parent can only sin a little makes nonsense of John's logics. That a child of a sinless parent can only sin a little. God does not allow sin, period. Whether a little or a big, God does not tolerate sin. So whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And so in fact, the continually, the continually or habitually view goes against John's intention and his argument throughout the epistle. And those of you who have been following me from the start of chapter one, you'll realize that John cut straight John is a man who does not mince words. John puts it this way. He's either you're in or you're out. He's either you're up or you're down. He's either you're saved or you're a sinner. He's either you're of God or, or you're of the devil. That is how John puts his thing. He does not find and he does not put forward a middle ground. So... This idea about the continually, continually or habitually um, sinning, it goes against John's view. That no sin is allowed to the Christian is the clear sense of the verse. Yet this must be balanced with chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. Bearing in mind that the Christian at the present time must struggle with the old nature, which is the enemy of God. And so we have to reconcile this now with verses, chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. Hmm? While we bear in mind that we, as believers, we still struggle with the old man, the old nature, which is the enemy of God of God. Now let us read Romans chapter 7 and verse 22. Romans 7 verse 22 and Romans 7 verse 23. Once you find it, you have to run it for me quickly. 7 verse 22. Yes. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I'm sorry, read 20 as well. Verse 20. 20. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's Thank you. 
Thank you, Sister Ray. So here it's saying, now Paul is saying, now if I, the new man, do that which I, the new man, would not, it is no more I, the new man, that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And Paul's conclusion now is simple. It is found in verse 25. You have it there, sister, right? Read verse 25 now. The same chapter 7. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Hmm. Thank you. So there's a clear sense, therefore, in which Paul could acknowledge that at the core of his being, the new man or the inward man does not and cannot serve sin. There's a clear sense in which Paul could acknowledge that at the core of his being, the new man or the inward man does not and cannot serve sin. The inward man is unable to be affected by sin. He is fully enslaved to God's will, and as such he cannot sin, because he, the new man, has been born of God. He, the new man, has been born of God. So whoever is born of God, um, John says, cannot, cannot sin. And here Paul is confirming that, that because the new man is born of God, the new man is enslaved to God's will, and as such cannot sin because he's been born of God. And notice also Galatians chapter 2, 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's the same concept we see here again. Since sin does exist in the Christian life, we have to admit that it is there, but sin that does exist in the Christian life is foreign to the inward, regenerated new man where Christ dwells in perfect holiness. So that's what it is talking about when it says does not commit sin. This is the new man that does not commit sin. But the new man right now is shackled to the old man. And the old man, which is the flesh, sins by nature. And so we have that kind of a war within our bodies where the new man and the old man are shackled together in the same body, the same body. The old man sins, but the new man cannot sin. The new man wars against the old man. And so Paul says the spirit wars against the flesh. There's a constant battle, Paul says, that he's faced with every day, where the spirit is constantly warring against the flesh. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the flesh warring against the spirit. Because the two are shackled together. The old man and the new man. And the old man is telling you to lie, steal, to commit all kinds of sin. And the new man is resisting that type of a temptation. Because the new man cannot sin. The new man cannot sin. That new man who has been born of God and fully enslaved to God's will cannot 
sin. Praise God. Now it goes on to say, for his seed remaineth in him. And this same verse could say, for the Holy Ghost remains in him. Or it could read, for the Christian is remaining in God. But it says, for his seed remaineth in him. Now to determine which of these is the more likely translation, we must notice John's use of the word seed in his writing. Now John uses the Greek word sperma, and which is the English word seed, five times in all of his writings. Three times in the Gospel of John, one time here in 1 John, and one time in the book of Revelation. So he writes of it enough so that we can get an idea of how he uses the word. In the Gospel of John, it appears in St. John 7 verse 42. Please find that for me. St. John chapter 7 and verse 42. Find at the same time St. Um, St. John 8 verse 33. And also St. John 8 verse 37. And Revelation 12 verse 17. So please read for me now St. John 7 and verse 42. St. John 7 verse 42. Had not the scripture said that Christ cometh to the seed of, the, of David... And out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was. Good. So here, the word seed means descendant or offspring. And in 8.33? And 8.33, they answered him, we, be a, we being Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man, how sayest thou he shall be made free? Offspring again, 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Great. So in every gospel instant, it means offspring. Once you see John uses it in the gospel of John, it means offspring. And in Revelation, John uses the word in chapter 12, verse 17. You have that? Read it for me, please. Revelation, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There again, it, thank you. There again, it means offspring. Offspring. Therefore, unless clear... And just cause is given, we must expect John to use the meaning descendant or offspring in his fifth and final use of the word in First John. So what we're saying is that since John is using this word to mean offspring, he used it three times in St. John, the Gospel of John. He used it one time in Revelation, and then he uses it another time in this chapter. And in all the other four, he was referring to seed. Then he must be referring here to the same seed. Amen? You follow me? Great. <clears throat> so here I, we believe that it should be translated as the Christian remains in God. This gives the phrase remains in him the usual meaning that it has in 1 John with the believer as the one who is abiding or remaining in God as the object. The believer is the one who is remaining, abiding in God, who is the object. And now if the seed is the offspring of God, that is the child of God, then what are the implications? First, 
The one who is remaining or abiding in him is not sinning, which is exactly what the re remainder of First John teaches. That the one who is the seed of God, who is remaining and is abiding in God, is not sinning. Because you cannot remain, you cannot abide in God if you have sin in your life. You with me? Secondly, it will coincide with the second half of the verse where the same point will be made in a different manner. Mainly, that a Christian cannot sin while he is al allowing the complete new birth to take effect. While he's allowing the complete new birth to take effect. If he yields himself totally to God, and allow the new birth of God to take effect in his life, he cannot sin. Amen. The Bible says, he does not continue to sin, neither does he have the ability to practice sin. And so this implies the absence of, of all sin. Therefore, John is teaching that all who are born of God and are remaining or abiding in him are not sinning. Are not sinning. You're not practicing sin. Not indulging in sin. Because you are born of God and you are remaining in God. Amen? You with me, church? Yes. I see some of you contemplating deeply yes but what John is putting forward to us is that once we are the seed of God born of God we are remaining in him and allowing his grace to take full effect in our lives then we will be like Christ like Christ you cannot practice sin once you are born of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Mm. So all who were born of God, which includes all Christians, and are remaining or abiding in God, that would be some Christians at some times, because remember, remaining is the equivalent of fellowshipping. Remaining is used interchangeably with the word fellowshipping. So when we remain, we are fellowshipping. When we are fellowshipping, we are remaining in God. And not all Christians are fellowshipping with God at all times. Not all Christians are fellowshipping with God at all times. So we have some Christians who are fellowshipping with God at some times, and when they are doing this, while they are fellowshipping with God, they are not sinning. While you're fellowshipping or remaining with God, then you are not sinning. But those who find themselves at times out of fellowship with God, not remaining in him, although you still come to church, you're still a Christian, but that's the time. When sin can enter the life of the believer. All who are born of God cannot sin while the new birth. Which is a completed action of God. Is still affecting their lives from moment to moment. And you can verify this in 1 John 3 and verse 6. You can write that down and look at it in your spare time. Now let's look at verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Thank you so much. This verse is the key to the, to the first ten verses of chapter three. The phrase in this is a reference to the principles and outlines of chapter three Verses 4 to 9. It says, in this, 
the children of God are manifest. In other words, in this, the children of God are revealed. And this manifesting or the revealing is to the local church and to the world, the, the outside world and to the local church. The church cannot fellowship with one who claims to be a Christian unless that one reveals his actions that he is indeed a Christian who is in fellowship with, with God. It's difficult to fellowship with a hypocrite. It's, 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 it's like pulling teeth to build a good relationship with a hypocrite. Yes? Unless you yourself are a hypocrite as well. Because two cannot walk together unless they agree. And so if you are fellowshipping with God, you are abiding in God, and of course God's love is having its full effect in your life. It's difficult to be very extremely close and to be fellowshipping with someone who is a hypocrite, who is not fellowshipping with God. And that is why from, from even personal experience, I cannot understand a Christian, and I mean a, a true Christian, whose best friend is an unbeliever. It, it has not worked with me, and I, I know it's a challenge for other believers, and I am not here saying that Christians cannot be friends with unbelievers. I'm not saying that. But your best friend, you would call you bench and whatever else you want to call it. Whether you are the bench or you are the other part, I don't know. <laughs> But it's, 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 I cannot see for the life of me how it is that you are fellowshipping with God and your best friend is out of fellowship, is someone who continues out of fellowship with, with Christ. Yes? So... The world cannot understand the uniqueness of the Christian unless the Christian reveals by his action that sin is to be abstained from completely if someone should fellowship with God. Because the Christian is a unique creature. The child of God, the believer, is a unique creature creature and the world cannot understand the uniqueness of the believer. They can't understand that you don't dip with them in the same bowl. The world cannot understand that you don't go with them to the same place. The world cannot understand how you don't enjoy the things that they enjoy. And yet you are still happy. And you are still living a joyful life. The world cannot understand that. And that is because the believer is a unique being. He's different from the unbeliever. How many of you are not enjoying your Christian life? You are bored in the church. How many of you? Yes? So you are enjoying your Christian life. How many of you go to parties? None of you? How many of you buy lottery? None of you? 
Yes? And yet you still get by, right? Now that is what the world cannot understand. The world cannot understand how it is that the believer walks this straight path without engaging in the things of the underworld, without engaging in corrupt activities, without selling drugs, without robbing and stealing, and yet you're still getting by, and you're happy. The world cannot understand it. And it's not that you are not, sorry, it's not that you are, you are in a big job, and you're still getting by. But it is because of the uniqueness of the believer. So the world cannot understand you because you are unique. Amen? So don't be surprised when your neighbors cannot understand how you operate. Don't be surprised when they accuse you of being a um, sorcerer and obia worker. Don't be surprised if they accuse you of being thieves and robber and liar. It's because they cannot understand your uniqueness. And the world will never understand you until they come in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. So remember the true nature of both the Christian and the sons of Satan can be concealed. Yes? And so remember we're talking about revealing yourself. Hmm? But remember that the true nature of the Christian and also of the sinner can be con concealed. Find 2 Corinthians chapter 11 for me, please. Verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13 to 15. For such men are false apostles, spurious counterfeits, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And it's no wonder for Satan himself, sorry, and it is no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So it is not surprising if his servants also masquerade as ministers of righteousness, but their end will correspond with their deeds. As reading from the Amplified Version. So here are false apostles. Here are false deceitful workers. They are lost and yet they are being made to look like the apostles of Christ. They are being made to look like the apostles of righteousness. So they conceal their true nature and reveal a false nature. They camouflage themselves wanting to look like the apostles of Christ, but they are not. They are the workers of Satan. Hmm? And look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. Matthew 7, 15. Read that for me, please. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Hmm. Thank you, Sister Wright. Again, the concept is clear. They are false prophets. These are unsaved people. They are outwardly sheep. Yes, they look like sheep from the, on the outside. Yes, but inwardly, they are not just wolves. They are ravening wolves. 
Oh yes, they come to tear you apart, to destroy you. But outside, they look like sheep. They come in and they appear to be one thing, but they conceal their true nature, which is another thing. They pretend to be sheep, but they are really wolves. We can see this also in 2 Peter 2 and verse 1 and Galatians 2 and verse 4. Yes? So we've seen the unsaved conceal his nature. But what about the Christian? Can the Christian conceal his true nature? Look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. Read that for me, please. 2 Peter 1, 5 to 9. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and ye and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Thank you so much. So here are all the earmarks of Christianity. Yes? And if a person has these marks, he will be fruitful. But if a person does not have these marks, that does not mean he is lost, but it does mean he is an unfruitful Christian. Yes? So he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see far off and that sounds like a lost person and he has forgotten that he has been purged from his old sins so these are Christians that have gone so far off the reservation that they no longer have the earmarks of being a Christian and they live life in such a way that they have forgotten practice practically speaking that they were ever saved to begin with. So these are people who are professing Christians, but they lack the earmark of the believer. And so they come in looking like the believer, but inwardly, like the unsaved man, inwardly, they do not possess the earmarks of the, the believer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 to 4 also, you have another set. Let's find that passage. Second, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Go ahead. Four. Okay. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. But ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Thank you. Thank you, Sister Wallace. So these Corinthians were or should have been experienced Christians, as this letter was probably written about five years after Paul had founded the church in Corinth. And now he's having to call them carnal. After five years of being in the, in the church, after five years of walking with God, 
Paul is having to call them carnal. Carnal here meaning of the flesh. That they are not who they profess to be. Hmm? So even after five years, they are not living a Christian life marked by those air marks that we read over in Second Peter. But rather, they are living a life marked by envy, strife, and divisions, which is the fruit of the flesh. The fruit of the flesh. So clearly, a Christian can conceal his true nature and look like a lost person. And an unsaved person can conceal their true nature and look like a saved person. Yes, an unsaved can come to church and dress like a church believer, dress like puss, backfoot, they would say. Yes, in the sun the best. Dressed in jacket and tie, dressed in white, Dress and charcoal, stocking and heels. Looking like a believer, but is really not a believer. And a believer can also dress looking like a worldly man. Yes, concealing their identity. But they are a believer. Mm-hmm. And that is why it's very important that we stick to our identity. Amen? Amen? As believers and as children of God. I don't know that there is a specific dress code for Christians. But the Bible admonishes us to be modest in all that we do, including our dressing. Amen? Amen? And so, brothers and sisters, though Satan's children can appear to be Christ-like, and though Christians can appear to be Satan-like, God knows his own and does not need to have the true Christian revealed to him who is his offspring. God knows those who truly belong to him. Yes? Yes? Therefore, the revealing is for the benefit of the church so it might discern who is the child of God and who is the child of Satan for the purpose of fellowship. And this revealing is for the benefit of the world so it might understand the holiness of God as exhibited through The Christian lifestyle. So the Christian must live a life that reveals his Christian identity. So that the world will understand God's holiness. Amen. And see God's holiness exhibited through the life of the believer. Believers, Christians, we should not grudge the world for their sinful lifestyle. And the way we operate at times would indicate that some believers are living in grudge of the world for their sinful lifestyle. Because we try to look like the world. We try to mimic the world. We try to follow the patterns of the world. It ought not to be so. We as believers are to set the pattern for the world to follow. Amen. And we are not to be in Christ and live a life as though we are grudging the world for their sinful lifestyle. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. It is said that when Abraham and Lot and Lot went out when God called Abraham Lot went with him. They reached a certain place. They pitched their tent. Lot pitched his tent toward Jerusalem. Abraham, sorry, Abraham pitched his tent toward Jerusalem. Lot pinched his tent 
towards Saddam. An indication of the intention of both men. Praise the Lord. Some believers don't pitch their tents good at all. Their tent is pointing in the wrong direction. Not pointing toward Jerusalem. It's pointing toward Sodom. There are believers today in the church who are closer to the world than to the church and to God. Brothers and sisters, our lifestyle, our lifestyle must indicate to the world the holiness of the God that we serve. Amen. So we should not conceal our Christianity, our Christian life. Wherever you go, and I'm not saying you must walk with Christian printed on your forehead. Literally. But believe me, brothers and sisters, if you're a true believer, it is going to be seen on your forehead. The world is going to see it in you. And so when you go to school, young people, your classmates must recognize that you are different from the others. You act differently. You walk differently. You even sound different from the others. When you go to work, brothers and sisters, at your workplace, even without saying that you're a Christian, the way you live, the way you operate at your workplace should indicate that you are different. Your uniqueness should come out at the workplace. Amen, somebody? Can I talk to us? So there are some things that we don't indulge in. Hmm? You cannot live a life that betrays who you are in Christ. Amen, somebody? The workplace must know that you are different. Your uniqueness must stand out. Amen? Amen, church? Amen. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Wherever we are in the community where we live, we cannot just be holy in church. We must be holy in the community where we live. People must know that we are Christians based on how we live and we operate. Brothers and sisters, we are not for once conceal our Christian lifestyle. Our Christian identity is what ministers to the world around us. It's a sermon by itself that is preached louder than you can actually preach from the pulpit. You are in a position to reach this community in a more effective way than any sermon that can be preached from this pulpit. In your homes, on the street, at your workplace, at school, wherever you are, your lifestyle can preach a louder sermon than anything that can be amplified from this pulpit. Let's not conceal our Christian identity. Praise God. Let's run quickly and wrap it. Verse 10. We're going to just run through these two verses. Verse 10. First John 3, verse 10. In this little children of God are manifest and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now we are entering a new section of the, the epistle. 
Until this point, the word righteous has been a key word for the book of 1 John. But in chapter 3, verse 10, we find the last use of the word righteous. And instead, we move into a discourse on love. So Paul has been, I mean, John has been highlighting righteousness right up to this point. Now he's moved into a discourse on love. Now up until this point, love has been only, be, love has only been used seven times in the, en the entire first three chapters. But in the remaining two and a half chapters, the word love and the verb to love will be used 35 times. 35 times. It's clear that John has changed and shifted gear from righteousness and love. And we will see the relation uh, between righteousness and, and love. Praise God. So clearly there is a new thing here and the new thing is love. And the following section will continue addressing love. So a failure to perform righteousness and a failure to love one's brother can never be traced to God. John had already said that sin, all sin can be traced back to the devil. Every sin is traced to the devil. John considered love as the appropriate expression of the regenerate life which he had been speaking or for which he had been speaking. John says, I want you to do righteousness. I want you to keep the commandments, but that's not enough. Just keeping or just knowing what the right thing is and trying to do the right thing by the law is not what is being required here. I'm looking for something more. I'm looking for righteousness in action. And the way that we put righteousness in action is to love one another. Is to love one another. The way we put righteousness into action is to love one another. Love is then righteousness in action for John. And it should be noted once again that only the Christian is in view here and not the unsaved. So he's talking to the Christian. The verse, therefore, would accurately be stating that when the Christian is not doing righteousness, that is when he is sinning, he is not drawing upon God as a source of power, but upon Satan and the dominion of darkness. According to chapter 3 and verse 8. Because no one can be drawing upon the domain of God. No one can be drawing upon God's power and be sinning. Once the Christian is not doing righteousness, he is drawing upon the domain of darkness. The domain of Satan. Verse 11, and we close it off. First John 3, verse 11. For this is the message that he heard from the beginning, that he should love one another. Thank you, sir. So to love one's brother is the breaking of Jesus's, or to not love One's brother is the breaking of Jesus' commandment found in John chapter 13 and verse 34. This is the commandment that Jesus is given. And it's important to know that this commandment was not given until after Judas had departed from the group. Yes? Thus the group to whom the commandment to love was given was composed entirely of Christians. Jesus waited until Judas had departed from the group to give this command. 
The commandment was not given to a mixed multitude, but it was given strictly to a group of Christians, a group of believers. The new subject matter, therefore, has to do with the command that was given only to believers and can be fulfilled only by Christians. The world cannot fulfill this command because love is what John had already said, the world does not have. John said the world does not have love, the world does not know how to love. And so this command must be fulfilled by the believers. Because the world is filled with hatred and envy and strife and divisions. And he says here, love one another. The only way that Christians are able to love one another is because of Christ's love for us and because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Even with that, it is difficult to love some people. Even with the enablement of the Holy Spirit and Christ dipping his love in our hearts, it is still hard to love some people. So can you imagine if you were not in Christ? Now you see why the, why the world hated him and why, why the world hates the believer. Because it is Christians that God is looking to to fulfill this command. The last verse, verse 12. First John 3, verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother righteous. Thank you, Brother Matthews. So John is not changing the context of the message. And he said, this is the message that you all have heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. Yes? Remember that we said that love was the, love is the old commandment. And it is also the new commandment. It's been from the beginning. And Jesus came and he wrote to us a new commandment, which is the same old commandment, which is to love one another. And this is the commandment that will take us into the new dispensation, that we love one another. Now in verse 12, the dichotomy here is clear. It is Jesus versus Cain. Jesus versus Cain. Cain reacted with hatred to a brother who was good. And Christ responded with love to sinners who reject God. Yeah? See the difference? Clearly. A brother who was good, Cain reacted with hatred. And the sinner who was bad, Jesus responded with love. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Each expresses his feelings in action. Cain took a life. Christ gave his life for us. Praise God. Cain took an innocent life. The life of one who did not deserve to die. Jesus gave his life for us who deserved to die. Praise God. Cain's actions revealed him to be evil. Christ's actions revealed him to be good. So John is contrasting the love and hatred. 
No one who hates is abiding in God. No one who hates is abiding in God. When you're truly abiding in God, you cannot hate. You can't hate even the worst person. And I don't know if you have ever realized that you've been forcing yourself to hate some people and it's not working. Have you ever been there? Because of what they have done to you. Yeah, they have really offended you. They have hurt you. And you have been forcing yourself. Because naturally you're supposed to hate such a person. Yeah? That's what the world dictates. And you've been there trying to tell yourself you hate them. Trying to force yourself to hate them. And you can't hate them. Why? Because the one who abides in Christ cannot hate. Cannot hate. For God is love. God is love. A Christian who is living in God's will is a loving Christian. Christians must love. We must love one another. We must love everybody. If you're abiding in God's will, we must love. We must love those around us. And finally, this first portion of this epistle deals with righteousness as the means for revealing one's new birth. Now love for one's brother in Christ is the means of manifesting the new birth. Yes? Righteousness reveals the new birth. And love for one's brother manifests the new birth. Amen? Righteousness does what? Reveals that you're a Christian. But love for your brother manifests that you are a Christian. We need not only the revelation of our salvation, but we need the manifestation of our salvation. We must manifest that we belong to Christ wherever we go. We must manifest that we are Christians when we are in our communities and in the church and at work and wherever we are, there must be the manifestation of Christ in us. Because Christ loves everyone. And as children of God, we ought to love because God is love. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. Let us love one another because love is of God. Praise the Lord. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining us as we continue to study the Word of God in this, our weekly Bible study. We do hope that you find this study in our series of the Epistles of John enlightening and inspiring. I invite you to join us as well for our Sunday morning worship service. Currently, we host three services on a Sunday morning. The first begins at 7 a.m., to 8.30 a.m. The second service is at 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And the third and final service is at 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook as well. Please like, share, and leave a comment. God bless you and thanks again for joining.